Welcome. This is the 91st Coffee with the Commissioner. Uh, good morning to everyone. Um, it's, it's a beautiful day in District 1, and we're very, very happy. We have a very special guest this morning. Uh, Mr. Bert Thornton is here with us. Good morning, Bert. Good morning, um, Jeff. As we joked a little bit before we started, uh, Bert wins the award for the best background. He has got the best background. That's awesome. Of course, Welcome to District 1. Amen. Amen. And then we have Eric uh, Gilmore here from uh, Public Safety and, of course, Wes Marino, uh, the county administrator. And there's so much going on. There's a lot going on. One of the things we're going to be approving tomorrow at our meeting is the half cent sales tax, adding that to the ballot. And I'll just say as a former, I'll just put a plug in as a former school board member, um, that half penny sales tax did a lot of good for the school districts. We built Ernest Ward Middle School with it. We built Souter Elementary School with it. We built Global Learning Academy with it. We did a lot of projects uh, throughout the 60 different schools around the district. So I would just encourage folks to continue it. And I know as a county commissioner, our, our penny sales tax, our local option sales tax is, I mean, Wes, you know, we we couldn't do, we couldn't do without it. We just could not do without it. So we were, I'm very, very thankful to the taxpayers of Escambia County for always approving those for the school board and for the county. And I will say uh, it, when I was on the school board, we had a very good watchdog committee. We keep their eye on things and assist the superintendent, the board members. So uh, good luck to those guys getting that uh, approved. I know that the taxpayers are going to do it, um, but I just would encourage them to do so. So we're going to get this thing started. And we're going to start uh, a little bit different today. We're going to start with Eric because he's got some interesting information about District 1, Bert, and about Perdido Key in particular and public safety. As everyone knows, last year we had a very, very uh, tragic set of circumstances. We had some a young family from Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, uh, unfortunately, they got caught in the riptides out out swimming, and then one of the family member tried to save another, and then they both drowned. And um, so, Eric, what are we going to do this year different out in Perdido Key in District One? So uh, we are going to have a presence, so a lifeguard presence on Perdido Key this year. Um, I'm working with uh, Alexander Johnson, my deputy water chief. He'll be here this morning. We're going to nail down some uh, things of what we what that looks like. It's going to be a hybrid system uh, because we are so spread out with beach accesses out there at Perdido Key. You know, one through four. Uh, we're looking at putting a hardened structure that the board uh, uh, let us buy with lost funds, might I say. It was uh, lifeguard towers with lost funds. Uh, so we we're going to put a lifeguard tower, looks like probably beach access two, and then uh, work on a roving patrol uh, after that. Because it's, it's very important that if we don't have a presence at access one, three, and four, that we have something roving to make public contact. That's that's the key, is that public contact, to talk to the people, make sure they understand the water conditions, make sure they understand the dangers, to go out there and put, you know, talk to people, put hands on them. Uh, before that, there was nothing out there. People just went out there. They just did what they wanted to. And, uh, you know, not understanding the dangers or anything, but we see at Pensacola Beach, making that public contact or making that contact is key to preventing uh, any drownings or anything like that. So, uh, as I said, that's kind of what we're looking at right now. We'll nail down some specifics here later this morning, uh, but that's, you know, that's subject to change. If we find that that's not truly working for our best interest or we need to reset, we might reset throughout the season, but that's roughly what it's looking like right now. A uh, lifeguard staying at two with a roving patrol at uh, one, three, and four. And of course we always have, uh, we've always had uh, lifeguards at Johnson's beach as part of that contract with Gulf Islands National Seashore that we uh, cover that area and been doing that for years. So we're excited to to bring something out there to be able to, to, to talk to the public and make contact with them. Now, Eric, but didn't did we or did we not uh, discontinue that contract with Gulf Islands or did they get around to renewing it with us? It renewed. It renewed. Oh, did so, it? OK. So, so there was so, there was talk that they weren't going to do that. There though, was right? talks. Uh, we didn't know where they were going to go with it. But uh, we did get the contract uh, a couple of weeks from them. So they're they're back up. So we're we're doing a contract with those guys, uh, Dave Greenwood and the uh the beach lifeguards have done a phenomenal job of promoting and trying to get people to uh, sign up with us and get hired on. As everybody understands, a lot of our a majority of our lifeguards are students. They're high school students, they're college students. So they're in school right now or they're away at school. So that's why we don't have the full contingent for spring break. Uh, that's why at the beginning of summer, we'll have something out there at the beginning of summer that we'll have the staffing to do that. We've right. got about 56, 57 lifeguards uh, that, that need to go through their training right now, get their CPR recertification, their emergency medical, and then, uh, you know, their aquatic, their uh, skilled, uh, the skills with uh, rescue and all that. So, uh, but they're working to get those guys trained up and get ready for the summer. And when they, when they rove in their white trucks, uh, do they or do they not? They have the flag on the back. So if you see a truck going by and it's got a red flag or a double red flag, I mean, is that the case? I mean, that, that's what they do, right? That's, that's correct. So they'll, they'll be riding by with the flag system and they're going to be responsible. We're going to talk about putting flags at each of the accesses. So, and they're going to be controlling those flags so people can see going in what the flags are going to be. 
Uh, everybody needs to understand that uh, Escambia County's flag system is different than Orange Beach's flag system. Mm -hmm. Orange Beach never flies a green flag. They don't even have a green flag. They start with yellow. They always say swim with caution. So I want everybody to understand that. Uh, you see green flags, we'll post a green flag, and they go, well, Orange Beach is posted yellow. Well, Orange Beach doesn't have a green flag. They never tell you that the water's, you know, it's a false sense of, it's a green flag. I could be able to go, I should be able to go out there and have no problems whatsoever. No, it's the Gulf of Mexico. Right. You always exactly. need to be cautious when you swim in the Gulf of Mexico. So uh, we're looking at probably, uh, yeah, that's something we'll talk about. Do we just post yellow flags at the ones where we don't have lifeguards and put a green flag where we're at because we are protecting with uh, uh, personnel there. So mm -hmm. those are some things we'll work out and uh, try to iron those things out this morning. Hey, Eric, what's up with all the great white sharks? So they just caught a great white shark in Navarre. They caught one at Pensacola Beach like last year. And then today in the paper, they're saying that another one pinged off the coast. I mean, I know it's probably Captain Turpin's or Chips Kirschenfeld, but what's with all the great white sharks at Pensacola, man? I what's have up? no idea. I can tell you I can tell you that, uh, you know, because of uh, emergency management and us watching the Gulf waters, I can tell you that uh, the Gulf waters have been warmer than usual. Uh, so maybe it's the warmer Gulf water. I don't know uh, huh. specifically, huh. but I do know that we've had – the the, screen, the uh, Gulf Stream come up uh, around the peninsula of Florida and get into the Gulf of Mexico and bring warmer water up toward the coastline uh, more than usual. So last year, uh, year before last, it was it was pretty good, pretty warm. Last year was pretty significant. It was pretty warm. Uh, that that plume of warm water really came up near the coast. So it maybe something to do with that. I don't know. So right on, right on. Well, appreciate everything you guys are doing. <clears throat> I know we've. Uh... We were coming dangerously close to opening that fire station in Beulah. It's been uh, seven years and 11 months, and maybe we could get in under eight eight years. What do you think, Wes? Can we get that thing done? Before the I'm optimistic years? about it, Commissioner. I'm optimistic about it. We're ready to get it on and get it done. Well, I tell you what, we walked through it about three weeks ago, me and John Singley, and uh, it's coming along. But I'll be honest, it wasn't as far along as I thought it would be. I, do you know if they poured that uh, bay floor yet or if they've got that done? I do not know that yet. I'll, I'll have to give it Rob, Rob Hogan a check. Outstanding. Well, I got to throw some kudos uh, at you, Wes. I mean, you've been managing a lot of different problems. Uh, <laughs> I know I send a lot my way. I can only imagine that my counterparts do as well, but appreciate all your work with, this, in particular, drainage, stormwater drainage. We've done a lot of work on our properties. We have a lot of properties that we own that are adjacent to business owners. And I'll just say for the record, you know, Wes has stepped up and, and really <laughs> had the crews out there helping, and we really appreciate it. And I know that um, Casey Lagarde just spotlighted a big project we did south of Nine Mile Road in District One, Windsong, and uh, that's going to be great for those uh, those neighbors over there. I'm, uh, hopefully, you'll put that on my Scamby so citizens can see it. I want Chris Curb to know about it. <laughs> I want the folks from Flood Defenders to know that we're spending money. We got a lot of money we're putting out in projects, and we're doing a lot with traffic and stormwater. But that's another one that I wanted to spotlight. But uh, Wes, what else do you? What else is going on in the county right now? Well, we have a board meeting tomorrow, tomorrow morning, and we'll be pulling six point eight million dollars of opera money. To allocate to different projects, Deerfield Estates, uh, Robbins Ridge, Biomarkets Basin Study, uh, Palmetto and Live Oak, Stacy and Quintet Road, uh, King, East Kingsfield and Ziegler Road drainage. So we have a lot of projects that are fixed and get. Some of them are already in design, so we're, we're ahead of the game there. But we're going to be pulling that money forward. We're going to go into construction here coming in to the latter half of the year. So it'll be extremely busy for us on top of the things we have going. We have our group. Uh, resurfacing packages going. I think Perdita Country Club Estates is scheduled yes. for some resurfacing on Shoshone and, and Doug Ford and maybe a few at Navajo, a few other roads maybe. Uh, we just got a lot of work going on every, everywhere we turn. Engineering is doing a great job. Public safety is, uh, they're clicking on all cylinders. If can't, can't, can't go without mission public works. Uh, they're always in the middle. It seems like they're in the middle of everything we do, no matter what's a contractor job or something, but they're always in the middle of it. Uh, development services is busier than they've ever been. Building inspections is busier than they've ever been. And uh, poor old John Robinson there at the animal shelter, he's still getting crazy stories from from, from, from the incidents that go on there at the animal shelter. You just wouldn't believe. But we're really doing well throughout the county. Steph and I, are, are we're working on the budget. Uh, we've been working on the budget since January, actually. Uh, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a never-ending process. Yes. So we're coming up into the budget workshops uh, here in June. And we'll, Steph and I will be meeting with all the departments uh, throughout April and May. And uh, it'll be a big budget, but we're going to do a lot of good things with it. And uh, we're looking forward to, to getting through the budget cycle. How is the uh, how's the tax roll looking, Wes? Are we going up? Uh, I, everyone's worried about it going backwards because of the interest rate hikes. And I don't think we're going backwards. We're issuing more building permits than we've ever issued. Yes. And, and same thing with developments, as you well know. 
Yeah. Uh, so we're hoping we're hoping for you know ten percent something right around there. <clears throat> Uh, increase in abnormal, just not increasing taxes, just the increase in abnormal due, due to development. You know, when we talk about development, Wes, you know, we've got an apartment complex being built on Nine Mile Road, and there are a few issues. I sent an email out yesterday. I drove out there yesterday, and there's additional issues going on. And you know, it, uh, one of the one of the things that I've talked about, you know, I've brought it a few times, and I want to continue the conversation about it is some form of concurrency or impact mm-hmm. fees or something. I mean, every Every county in the state has it, except it feels like, except for us. It's kind of like when every other county in the state had the 100, 100 year flood, uh, flood uh, storm uh, protocols and we had the 25 year. It seems like we're a little bit behind. Um, you know, I, I do feel like the development puts puts a lot of impact on, you know, roadways or stormwater public facilities. You know, I know it was in statute before. I know in 2011, Governor Scott at that point took it out. Um, we put it in the land development code and then 2013 that was taken out of the land development code. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I brought it a few times. It's been received with a lukewarm reception, but I do think mm-hmm. there's some value in it. You know, what's your thoughts on that? Cause you lived with it both ways as a long-term employee. Yeah. I think it's high time we take a look a little more in depth dive into the land development code. I don't think in 2013, I don't think anybody imagined, uh, the rate of the growth, that would be in years to come, especially now in the type of growth with the townhomes and apartment complexes and, you know, the parking, uh, there's just a lot of, a lot of uh, concerns there. And even, you know, you have folks that, that bought 20 years ago and what they thought would be just an established quiet subdivision. And then they, here, here, here comes the development all around them and myself included, you know, I right. live out in Beulah, I got a 385 lot subdivision coming. Right. I'm not sure how we're going to get out of Woodside Road, but we're going to try. But yeah, you know, that's it, a nightmare. That one in particular is a nightmare. And, and here's what folks need to know. I mean, I, I got beat up for another subdivision that showed up. And and I, you know, at the last meeting, there was a gentleman who, you know, came to the meeting, was very animated, very uh, worked up. And, and you know, we have to explain to him that, you know, there's a land development code. If you buy a piece of property and you have certain development rights attached to that property, I mean, it never comes back to the board. It doesn't even go to the planning board. We don't. We're not aware of it. So I agree with you. And one of the things I'd like to do is is look at the land development code and, and maybe from top to bottom and we need to modernize it and update it. And um, I think add some form of it at a minimum transportation concurrency, you know, mobility fees. I know Christine Fanchi, we brought that in 2021. I didn't get support from the board, but that's one of the issues I hear the most, Wes, is the transportation, the traffic, yep. um, you know, and and I know that we're bringing the advanced traffic management system uh and the state's going to put that in and we're, we're cost sharing with that. And that's going to be up by public safety. That'll be a great, we can't build enough blacktop to make everyone's commutes, uh, you know, not inconvenient. I mean, you're going to sometimes still have traffic, but with that intelligent, intelligent traffic system, um, I think that'll make our roadways much more efficient, but, um, but that's something I, I, you know, I'm going to bring that back. I'm going to keep banging on it until we get it. Cause we're the only County that doesn't have it. I mean, it's like when we were at four cents on the bed tax and everyone all around us was at five or six, and you would have thought I shot someone's dog when I brought that forward, but we got it. And now we got an extra almost $3 million a year that we're going to put into the Bay Center. Final thing before we go over to Bert, um, speaking of the Bay Center, you know, unfortunately, I'm, not, I'm going to be traveling to Cape Coral. I'm not going to be at the meeting tomorrow, but um, I know that we're, we're doing a facility assessment. Um, tell us about that and, and how that intermixes with SMG's uh, uh, version, given that Mobile is updating their Civic Center now, too. Yeah, so we've been looking at that. Uh, we had a, we've had a couple of meetings reviewing some of the options that we have available to us. There's like three or four options. We're looking at something maybe in the middle that would increase revenue, in, increase seating capacity. Uh, the point of the point of sales there with concessions. I think all that can work together. I think we can be competitive. Um, it's a good plan. I think it's it's not the it's not it's not the uh, Lamborghini plan, but. But it's but it's not the Yugo plan either. So I think we can. We don't want the Yugo. We don't want the Yugo. We don't want Yugo. We don't want that. So uh, Michael Kapp is doing a phenomenal job there at the base center. He's been guiding us along through this, and Populous was our our consultant. And I think we have some good options where they actually put some some skin in the game, and we may get to a point where we can eliminate that sub- subsidy out of the TDT, which would be fantastic. Yo, know, I I know that I know that the TDT. The TDC members would be ecstatic if we were able to do that. I can Absolutely. not speak for them, but I can just tell you the sense would be great. You know, the concern about that is in 2019, before COVID, we had a couple of great uh, shows at, at the Pensacola Bay Center. One of one of them was Five Finger Death Punch. I got to go see him. 
they're coming again, but they're going to Mississippi Coast Coliseum. There's another good show, Judas Priest. They're going to Mobile, uh, you know, and I worry a lot of good shows are going to the wharf. I just do believe that we need to modernize that base center. Um, thank yeah, God yeah. for Greg. Thank God for Greg Harris and the Petscola Ice Flyers. I mean, those guys are killing Absolutely. it. Five, six. I mean, my gosh, they are single-handedly. I mean, just kudos to those guys. I mean, what a great hey, ice hockey in Pensacola. Who would have thought? Judas Priest now. You're wishing way back in the day. <laughs> hey, I'm a rocker from the 80s, man. Way back. I love Judas Priest. I'm bummed out I can't make that show, man. I'd love to see. He comes out with a Harley and the whole thing and the hats. Yeah, it's great. You know what? You know what's really cool about that? Those guys are getting in their 60s and 70s, and they're still out rocking. I love it. I there, love you it. Yeah. there you go. Yeah. Uh, quick, qu quick story before I get to Bert. Um, I, I was able to see the Rolling Stones. Uh, when I was 21 years old um, in 1989 in Los Angeles. And and I remember my buddies and I, we did a road trip. It was a great, great time. But I remember looking at those guys and I'm like, man, those guys are 50 and they're still up there. They're too old. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am at 55. I love it, man. And, hey, the Rolling Stones are still touring in their 80s now. God bless there America. God bless. There you America. go. They're getting after it. Right on. Well, hey, we have a special guest this morning, Bert. Bert Thornton, uh, what can I say about this guy? What an amazing speaker. Um, what an amazing um, philanthropist. What a guy who gives. Um, he's a he's a resident right here of Escambia County. We've, we've got our own little treasure here in District 1 in Perdido Key, <laughs> Mr. Bert Thornton. And uh, I had the opportunity to see him speak at a recent uh, management retreat that I attended with the company I work for, ESA South. And it was incredible. I can tell you, when Bert was speaking to that group, you know, you could tell here, here's here's how, you know, if a speaker's got the room, no one's playing with their phones, right? No one's playing with their phones. No one's doodling notes. That room, Bert, I got to tell you, you had our attention, man. Thank you so much for coming out and doing that. And thank you for what you do. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've done and uh, how you got to be a public speaker and an author? Sure, Jeff. And it was great to talk to the good folks at ESA South. <clears throat> what a great group you have. So, I was actually born in New Orleans, raised in Tampa, so I'm a Florida guy. Uh, went to school in Tampa High School, and then I was uh, I got a full football scholarship to Georgia Tech. Uh, played for Bobby Dodd. You folks are familiar with Bobby Dodd. The the uh, the folks that are now going to concerts have never heard of him, um, nor have they heard of Bear Bryant, unfortunately. Oh. Um, but I played football at Georgia Tech, and then I went into the Army. I had uh, the polar opposite experiences. I had a wonderful year in, in Miami and a not-so-wonderful year in Vietnam. Um, then I came back to uh, uh, the United States and went to work for NCR in their IT division as a systems analyst and, and salesman. Uh, this this will be interesting for you. I sold the... the uh, Century system, Century 100, 200, 300 against the IBM system three. The Century 100, which was the base system, um, Eric, Wes, what do you think the the memory was, the, the RAM capacity was on the base unit, the Century 100 at that time? Well, how, how big was the machine? Well, let me, <laughs> yeah, it was about the size of the room I'm sitting in. Yeah. <laughs> But but the memory the the memory was sixty four k okay k wow. yeah now you got to remember we sent people to the moon with these kinds of machines and mm -hmm. but we had a, a, thousands of them linked together there was a lot of in out time so loved the business but didn't like the big corporate hassle got a call from my uh, fraternity brother at Georgia Tech whose father was the founder of Waffle House Joe Rogers Senior. And Joe Rogers Jr. had gone off to, um, he'd done his military service, and then he went to Harvard to get his MBA. He wanted to be an investment banker, and he realized he could have more fun, he, uh, have more fun and, and, and make more money um, if he <clears throat> went to work at Waffle House and took it to another level. He got in there and realized he was going to need some help, so he raised his hand, called me. I went up there. He said, please come up and talk. <clears throat> I went up. I flew up there from uh, <clears throat> Tampa and <clears throat> excuse me, the next thing I knew, I was flipping eggs and turning hamburgers. <laughs> and 40 years uh, later, um, ensuing in that process, uh, he became chairman, I became president. We had about 45 uh, Waffle Houses when we got it all together and started. And 
a little over 2,000 today in 25 states. So it was, um, and we open a Waffle House someplace about every week, um, five or six days. Um, so Waffle House has been great to me, and it's been great to Escambia County. We have a, a, a great presence here. Our senior vice president, um, or rather our area vice president who runs this Northwest Florida market uh, is a young lady named Krista Ardinger, and she is uh, a wonderful, wonderful operator. I was lo looking at the P&J this morning where they list uh, restaurants with problems and the restaurants that have perfect grades. And she has always got uh, Waffle Houses in uh, the perfect grade area. So 40 years with Waffle House, I retired uh, actually in 2011. We bought in Perdido Key in 2002, but I never really had time to come down here. I was always in some place from Savannah to, to Phoenix or Elkton, Maryland to, to uh, um, Key Largo. And <clears throat> the end of the story is that when I retired, uh, I realized that I had spent just a, a great deal of time mentoring people, certainly at Waffle House, hundreds and hundreds of people at Waffle House, at um, Georgia Tech, faculty, staff, uh, and students. Um, and, and other folks, starting with my three sisters, all Georgia Tech, I mean, my three daughters, my three daughters, all Georgia Tech graduates and their friends. Um, and I realized that, that there were a lot of people in the fog and I could help lift them out of the fog, but there were so many that I would never be able to sit across the table and answer questions that they might have. So I had always taken notes. Um, you heard me give the talk about success tactics, the basic yes. laws of success, Jeff. Yep. And, and uh, the number one thing that successful people do is they always uh, take notes. Eric and Wes will agree. You can't keep it all right here. You've got to write it down or put it in your personal device. You'll go crazy if you try and remember everything. So I always took notes when I talked to folks uh, about the questions they had and the answers I gave. And I put that in one file in a separate file. I had, I kept things that resonated with me, notes that I got from people, things that I read, uh, links to uh, uh, things that I saw. And I sat down and I sort of combined those two files um, into a mentoring book. The book is called Find an Old Gorilla. There you go. And the title's crazy, but the premise is if you wake up one morning and realize you got to go through a jungle, it would make sense to find an old gorilla like Eric or Wes, because the old gorillas know where all the good paths are and also the quicksand and the jungle and take them along. So it's a leadership book about how to figure out where you are in life and what you really want, not what you think you want, but what you really want and how to find the right people to help you get there. It touches on what I think are the 10 basic laws of success. And it looks at the leadership model, what successful leaders do and don't do, what they think about and don't think about. I had the pleasure two days ago of uh, speaking to Marie Mott's group at the Escambia County Health Department. And we talked um, a lot about the basic laws of success and the eight um eight human behaviors that pe when two people meet for the first time, there's a lot of evaluation that goes on. And it, it, it takes place along eight behaviors. And I call them the eight great social tells because if you're alert and, and know what they are, you can pretty much tell where somebody's been, where they are now and where they're going. And we talked about that and a number of other things. So um, I also wrote, and by the way, this book, <laughs> won a National Book Award last year. Congratulations. The, the AUPHA, thank you, the AUPHA, the Association of University Programs in Healthcare Administration, named it one of 18 books to be recommended in over 100 colleges and universities. So, so there's a lot of wisdom in this book. I'd like to tell you it's mine, but it's basically that file of things that resonated with me. Um, there are pro probably a couple of ideas that, that I had, a couple of BFOs. You, you know what a BFO is? 
blinding Sam. blinding flash of the obvious oh yes 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 that's in the book yeah. that's in the book yeah. yeah where you hear something you say oh yeah I've, I've heard that well, Bert, let, let me ask you something about the book in particular because i read it and um and i just want to point out Bert. you know Bert gives his talks and he told me uh when he came to the management retreat he gave 44 uh talks last year and he does it at his own expense he doesn't take speaker fees mm -hmm. and he also brought books he brought books for more than 40 attendees at our management uh, seminar this one and um your, your other book on mentoring the value of mentoring yeah high uh, impact mentoring practical practical guide to creating value in other people's lives yeah and and i and i just would say that um this book if you get a chance to read it, it, it it'll take you about an hour i mean it's a very thin book but it gives you the thing i wanted to ask you bert now that you're on the coffee how did you come up with the matrix would like to have kind of would like and will not tolerate because it it really simplifies things and boils it down to the basics yeah. You know, people, when I talk, people think I talk about this stuff, but I don't do it. These many of the solutions in the book, matter of fact, every one of them that I didn't steal from somebody else um, are things that I do to sort out the problems of life. And again, with Marie Mott's group, that's what we were talking about. We talked about change because they're undergoing some cultural change there. And we talked about how to sort out problems. And when I'm trying to figure out what is the best path to take or what I really want to do, I create a, I take out a piece of paper and I draw two vertical lines and I label the columns got to have, like to have, and will not tolerate. And I start thinking about the, the if this is successful, if this, if I get the result I want, what do, what do I absolutely have to have? And it's a good thing for young people to sit down and say, what do you, what do I want in life? What have I got to have? Then what would be nice to have? Be great to have it, but it's not a deal breaker. Okay. And then this is what I won't put up with. And that, that's sort of how, that's one of the many tools that I use to uh, sort things out and, uh, sleep well at night because if you don't if you don't have it all on paper um it buzzes around in your head and uh, you can't go to sleep there are just too many things to think about so i tell what? people to get it on paper and use that little i call it a personal reality check mm -hmm. once you get it on paper it sort of nails everything down and you sleep a little better at night you know when you talk about that uh I, I, one of the things I liked in your book, and I, I really it resonated with me, you said when you were 39 years old, you went and met with someone who was a decade older than you to right. find out how the 40s would be. And you you say in the book that you've you've done that ever since. What? How did you come up with that? I love that idea. And do you still do it? Yes, I do. And um, I don't know. Maybe it was a BFO for me because uh, I was I was sitting there in my late 30s and I, th I had a lot of franchisees, Waffle House franchisees, who were in their 50s. And I thought, you know, the 40s, I'm going to look at and be like somebody in my 50s. And that's going to probably will determine that my actions and my relationships in the 40s. Um, I, I didn't know about the old gorilla at that time. I didn't have that in mind. But I, in retrospect, I needed to go find an old gorilla that had been through the jungles of the 40s. So we sat down and yes, and I've done that. Um, I've done that every decade. I just turned 79 uh, a couple of weeks ago. And um, so I'm in the process now, but I've got to find people in their 90s to tell me about how the 80s are. And those those folks, that's 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 a thin market. I was going to tell you, I, I uh, you want to hear something crazy. So I'm so I'm you know, I'm, I'm out in the field now. Let's just say I'm doing some campaigning <laughs> and I met a gentleman that's 90 years old and man, maybe I can connect you with him still lives at home yeah. gardens. He showed me, he insisted that I come into his house. He showed me all the plants. And then in his backyard, he's got rows and rows of blueberries, blackberries, potatoes. He wants me to come help dig potatoes. And the guy was just the most gracious, uh, just gentle soul. And uh, maybe you could meet with him. He, he served in the military. He lost a uh, lost. He told me the whole story, man. And it was great. It was awesome. Lost a lost. Lost a brother in World War II, yeah. lost a brother uh, in the service in Vietnam, and um, took care of his wife for many years. Has a hot rod in the garage. I'm telling you, Bert, that might be a 90-year-old for you to talk to. 
I would love to talk to him. And I, you, you talk about how nice he was. I think the older you get, the nicer you are because, uh, you know, you, you've been around the, the, uh, the stadium a few times and you've, you've gotten your fanny kicked, uh, more than once. And yeah, you got a little experience, you know what experience is, don't you? Mm -mm. What is it? Experience is what you get right after you needed it. And so <laughs> you got, you got plenty of experience and, uh, you got plenty of scars and you realize that at the end of the day, it's all about family and friends. Uh, I tell people when you're, when you're lying there, taking your last breath, the people around you aren't, aren't going to be your deal friends. They're going to be your real friends. Yes. All, the, all the folks that you deal with will be someplace else. So that's um, when you get a little age on you, you have, you have a different uh, perspective than the, than the, unfortunately, the instant gratification crowd we well, got running around. I have, folks, to, I have all the answers, but haven't heard most of the questions yet. Well, you know, I, I met the guy and I just told him, I said, man, I want to be like you. And I grow up to find someone 90 years old, walking around gardening, still doing things. I, you know, of course it's a cliche, but I asked him, I said, Bert, I said, uh, I said, his name is Doyle. And I asked him, I said, Doyle, what is your secret, man? You know, cause you, you read about the oldest Japanese woman in, in the world and she, she drinks sake every day or the guy that in France smokes. His, and he says, nope, I've never drank and I've never smoked. So he goes, it's just good food, good living. And, uh, but um, I, I I'm gonna make it a I'm gonna make it a point to connect you with this gentleman. I'd man, I'd love to see that happen. Yeah, I think you'd really enjoy. It. I would tell you that I think one of the one of the secrets to a, a longer life is just to figure out a way to be comfortable in your own skin. That's stress is the great killer, and, and until you figure out a way to, um, I tell people you only have four options: you can both hope, dope, or cope. Until you can figure out a way to cope with what's going on in life and become comfortable in your surroundings and your own skin, that's a tremendous stress reliever. St stress is is a killer. So let me ask you: in the restaurant business, um, for a, for a minute there, I owned a, a small restaurant. My wife and I did, and then I until I could quickly sell it as fast as I could. Um, but it's stressful, and the cook calls in. You're on the grill. I know forty years in Waffle House, you've spent some time on the grill. And the orders stack up and it gets stressful. How how does Bert Thornton deal with stress? What do you do to relieve stress? Well, yeah, I did grow up on I grew up on the grill. That my, you know, my first job in Waffle House was uh bussing tables and washing dishes, uh, mopping floors. And then I graduated to grill op. We call them grill operators, not cooks, but graduated to to grill operator. And uh, interestingly, we have um Waffle House is a performance-based company. We've got some grill operators out there making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year um, because they have they they've cooked a lot and they're they're so good. Uh, we've got a cook named Ryan, grill operator named Ryan, at the Gregory Street Waffle House, number five eighty six, and we keep track of how much food our folks cook, and he's coming up uh, on three million dollars. So. Yeah. So, so he's, he's making a lot of money. He's, he's, uh, he's one of our best. Anything you do in life as work is stressful. I mean, Eric's job is stressful. <laughs> this his job is stressful. Jeff, you you've got double stress because you've got the County and ESA South, but I think one of the secrets that, that I've found to, eliminate that stress. First of all, I used to run a lot. Hmm. Um, I, when I was in Waffle House, we were a lot of runners. I used to run a marathon a year. I ran three in 1985. <clears throat> Everybody else would go, um, you know, at the end of the day, they'd, they'd go find a cocktail and I'd go out on a six mile run. But so that was a great stress reliever. Um, but I think that 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 secret of when you become overwhelmed, writing put just put it doing a mental dump on a piece of paper writing air dumping all of your problems writing them all down you don't have to sort them out you don't have to come with solutions just putting up putting all of your problems on a piece of paper everything that's working for you and everything that's not working for you and then stick it in the drawer and then the next morning when you get up and let me tell you that night you'll go to sleep and sleep like a baby because they, they won't buzz around in your head the next morning you pick it up, 
you look at the stuff that's not working for you, the, the, the stressful items, you prioritize them, and then you go to work on number one. And that grounding, focusing effort is just re reduces stress dramatically. So put it on paper and then sleep and then pick it up the next day and contemplate it. That's good. And I, I think the running, they, they do say exercising is a way to, to eliminate stress if you have time. But the problem is a lot of folks are on a time crunch. You can't exercise. But I wanted to ask you this because you've had decades of experience working with people, training people, mentoring people. And one of the things I hear today is the work ethic. You know, you talk about the younger kids, gener uh, the millennials, Generation Z. And I wanted to ask, in your experience, do you see wor the work ethic differences between the generations? I mean, you know, I'm Generation X. You know, I've, I've worked my whole life, mm -hmm. but um, I know that in this day and age, there's a lot of folks that perhaps don't put the value on work. Maybe they weren't, that wasn't instilled in them. You've mm -hmm. seen all, you've seen the spectrum. What are your thoughts on the differences between the, the generations? I'm going to tell you what my daddy told me. There's nothing new under the sun. Um, everything's the same. There's just a different crowd doing it. I, I believe that this idea and i had this conversation yesterday i, I had uh, uh lunch in a restaurant wasn't a waffle house and there was this black gentleman sitting next to me and we got talk talking about um racial strife and what's going on in america today and we we agreed i told him and he agreed i said you know i read about this in the paper and i hear it in the news and then i go to a waffle house and everybody's friendly right everybody's getting along. There's just no, none of, none of what you read. So, um, and I think it's the same thing with this generational thing in any generation, you've got people who are go-getters and you got generation, generational people who are laggers. Uh, I, I personally have not seen any difference. We, we still recruit people who, uh, are willing to work hard 24 7 365 and rise to the top um, all the people that we recruit don't end up doing that but it's the percentages really aren't any different um, through the decades and I the, the old adage no matter how stony the path some forge ahead no matter how easy to go in some lag behind yep. I think you, I think you find that in, in every generation one of the things that I really keyed in on from your speech Bert was Everyone wants to be a people pleaser. You know, you got people and and you you had a really great thing that you said. If you say yes begrudgingly to someone for something they've asked of you, like, okay, I'll do it. I really don't want. I love what you say. You say you've made two people upset yourself because you right. really didn't want to do it. And then right. the person you're gonna do. But I love I love the way you you uh you you nuanced your no, the way to say no and practice it. Show show us how you say no, Bert. <laughs> well, I can, you know. Great here's here's another stressful thing you know people get overwhelmed because they don't know how to say no um yeah. they have a full plate and somebody comes up behind them and says hey uh hey wes will you do this for me <laughs> and uh wes or or eric or jeff or bert says well you know i um okay so that's one more thing on the plate and they don't they don't say no because they don't know how to say no so as as you when i talk to groups like like your group uh, we practice how to say no and <laughs> people say where did you come up with that and i say well that's one of the ways that i've learned how to say no and i say no i'd love to help you out but i can't i've got something else i've got to do that's going to keep me from doing that and i hope you find somebody else real soon and i give them a little smile at the end that makes that medicine go down uh, but there are other ways to say no. You can say, I'm sorry, I have a full plate. The best way that I've found to say no to somebody in, in, and make them understand it and not feel bad. And, and I, I told this somebody last week, um, they asked me to do something. And I said, you know what? I'd love to do it for you, but my plate is so full right now. I wouldn't do a good job for you. So you, you need to go find somebody who, who will do a great job. If I took that on, you wouldn't be pleased with what you got. That's a nuance. That's kind of a nuanced play on your uh, 
on your way of saying no. Now, I got to say a couple things. Um, Chris Kerb, <laughs> Wes, he was on the call and he said, thank you for the Wind Song Surrey project. Yeah, you're welcome, Chris. And then uh, George uh, likes the um, the three column, but he says, uh, is that the, the Tregno method uh, of the 70s have must wants? Does that ring a bell with you at all, Bert? I know. So. Yeah, there's a Not lot of things. I'm always happy. I don't plagiarize. I'm always happy to get in, in the book. Uh -huh. Their footnotes are 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 many, given yes. full credit for everything that that uh, that I use from somebody else. So no, I, I haven't heard that, but I might have I might have the name. It, it probably kept him from uh, kept him uh, uh, from being being awake at night. Also, <laughs> well, you know, um, <clears throat> there's there. Throughout throughout the time and, and in your book, you do met, reference Zig Ziglar. You know, everyone knows he was the like the consummate salesman. And uh, I, I like and you you reference multiple uh, people that were influential in your life. But one thing I remember, I wanted to ask you about it because the, the book is is very, very short. It gets to the point and it, it's really great. And by the way, um, I'm going to send one copy to each of my sons. I got a 25 year old and a 22 year old. And, you know, I what I told you and, and what I believe. What I, and what I really feel is I wish someone would have had a book like this when I was 25, because you really you take a lot of shortcuts and it really helps you get to what's important quick. One Thanks. book, one book that I read, and I know you're probably familiar with it, Bert, when I was younger, maybe not 25, maybe 30, was it was called The One Minute Manager. It was a thin book and it was told a story. Are you familiar with the One Minute Manager series? Sure. Ken Blanchard. Yes. Yes. You know, I actually took a uh, a uh, situational leadership um management course from Ken in Dallas when I was running the restaurants west of the Mississippi. And uh, he, uh, my, funny story, it, you know, you and I know a little bit about business, but we know a lot about people, all three of us on this call. And I, I read him as not being happy. And I went up after, it was a two-day seminar, and I went up after the seminar and I I said, you know, I really enjoyed it, but uh, I have to tell you, it was pretty, it was rather perfunctory and um, you don't look like you're happy doing what you're doing. And he said, you know, to be honest with you, I'm not, but he said, I've just combined with another guy to write a book and uh, we hope it's going to go someplace. And that was the one minute manager wow. went out. It was an overnight success. It was an absolute home run. I ran into Ken on an airplane um, about eight months later, and to his credit, he remembered my name. I couldn't believe it, uh, but I was in Waffle House uniform, so uh, that might have he helped him. And I said, looks like you hit the home run. He said, yeah, we've been very pleased. And I did notice he was sitting in first class, and I was going back to coach. Hey, but here's the important question. Was he happy? Is he happy yeah. now? <laughs> Got a smile on his face. Oh, my gosh. Well, Man, I uh, again, I appreciate your time. I really appreciated that lecture. I know all the guys, all the managers from around the country really got a lot out of it. They were still talking about it days after. No, but, I, you know, well, I, you know, one of the things you talk about is there's a list of things that you do, successful people do, habits. And it's kind of interesting. You say these are easy to do, but they're easy not to do. So, uh, you know, what is the most important easy to do thing that you would tell a young person, you know, maybe 22, 23, enter in the workforce, not really sure what they're going to do. What's number one, Bert? Yeah, I, people, when I go around the country and talk to folks, the number one question I'm asked is, Bert, is there a silver bullet to success? Is there just one thing you could tell me that will send me off on that road to achievement and prosperity? And uh, Jeff, turns out there is a silver bullet and, and here it is. If you want to be successful, hang around successful people. Who you hang around at every stage in your life determines where you end up in life. And um, if you want to be rich, hang around rich people. If you want to be respected, hang around respectable people. And so the silver bullet is, if you want to be successful, hang around the right people. That's the number one key for a young person, hang around the right people and in the right environment. Um, and then I tell them that the bigger, better, faster, stronger bullet, the gold bullet is while you're hanging around the right people, find a great mentor, someone who has a personal interest or, or a sincere interest in your personal success, um, someone with a, a demonstrated track record of success. I mean, if not, why would you listen? Uh, someone who has knowledge or expertise in your particular area of interest. And here's the most important point and 
you will agree, peer respect. The greater the respect by his or her peers for your mentor, the greater your chances of success. That for someone who is in the either the mature 14, 15, 16, 17, or the 18 to even 40 crowd, um, that's that's the most important thing you can do if you want to get on that road to success. Um, you know, uh, when you talk about mentorship and I know that that's, that's very important to you. And I know it's very important in business. I mean, you have to, you have to groom your successors. You have to groom right. leaders. Tell me about how you became, uh, and, and I guess the question I would ask you is you, you, you put a, a big value on mentorship. Are you currently mentoring folks uh, within Waffle House and other companies? I, I, uh, I mean, actively doing that. Yes, of course. I, uh, I'm on Quint Studer's board at uh, Studer Community Institute, and there are, there are many, many opportunities to mentor there. We have a program called Accelerate Roundtable, which are uh, a lot of uh, business, young emerging leaders who get together and talk about issues that confront them. And I, I head up that group. I'm sort of the master of ceremonies, if you will, the, the group leader. Uh, and then we also have the Venture Mentoring Service which um, we take some emerging companies, about 45 of them, I believe now, um, and young companies that are trying to figure out how to be successful. And there are teams of organizational leaders, many names um, certainly that you would know, that volunteer to sit down with these folks uh, at their request and go through um, their problems and try and be the old gorilla that gets them on the right path and out of the quicksand. So yes, I do that. I do that personally. Um, I have several people that I meet at my downtown office, which is the Waffle House on Gregory Street in the back booth. And I try to uh, uh, help them avoid the scars that uh, you and Eric and Wes and I have on our backs. And, uh, <laughs> try and get them on on the uh, the straight and narrow path and avoid that quicksand. Let me ask you a little bit about um, volunteering to mentor. I know the county, we have a great program. It's called our Summer Youth Employment Program. I know it's a big, big initiative of uh, my my peer, uh, Commissioner Lumen May, and the, the county embraces it. We've branched out now. The, ju the judges are now, we, we're bringing young students uh, you know, entering the workforce and we're giving them a taste of what it's like to work for the county. And it's been it's been a really big success. Um, and we've had willingness of employees. We've had buy in to do it. But I know other opportunities exist for uh, for taking someone under your wing. When I was on the school board, we have a youth motivator, uh, motivator mentor program. We also had uh, take stock in children. I was able to participate in that and help. Um, Last week, I was at the opening day of the ballpark, and I spoke with the, the president of the ballpark, and and I asked him, I said, you know, I asked, how, how are things going here? And, and and this is the question I have for you, Bert. He said, well, you know, it's it's about 20% of the parents that, that will really step up and volunteer, and it's, it's, it's difficult because it just seems like volunteers, people to step up and mentor, uh, it's, it's on the decline. What are your thoughts on that? How do we re-energize our citizens locally, nationally, throughout the country? To get involved with a, a young kid, get, in call, get involved in mentoring, get involved in youth sports. How do we do that when folks are so busy? How do we do it? Yeah, I don't. Well, busy is a relative thing. I, I always say if you want to get something done, give it to a busy person because they're or, they are organized enough to get it done. Quint Studer said one time, I every time he does something I like, I just write him a little note or I send him a text or an email. Yes. And he said in a, a presentation uh, one time, why, why is it that the busy people always take the time to do something? And the answer is because busy people have organized their time around getting things done, whatever is is on their plate. That's why it's so important to keep stuff that is not important off the plate. But how do you rally people to do things? I have an advice. I was, uh, had a, a founding board role with the Charter Public Elementary Middle School at, in DeKalb County, the, the Museum School of Avondale Estates, and um, and I'm still on their advisory board. And it's a top 5% um, school. It was the Charter Public School of the Year. Um, the principal was the principal of the year, the, the, the year before. And 
it's just a magical place. But one of the solutions is that they entreat parents to come and participate. And frankly, that's the key to any successful school is parent participation. Um, and they actually made it a requirement. Um, and somebody said, well, that you, that's against the law. And I, and I said, well, okay, let somebody sue us then. But, you know, the, that's great. Yeah, that's great. I mean, let's do the right thing. And then if somebody wants to take offense to it, then we'll, you know, we'll play that ball where it lies. But I don't think there's any, any magic bullet to getting people involved. There's always a, a certain number of people who will want to, to help. Uh, and there are some people who either think they're too busy or they are just lazy. And that's okay too. Every, you know, everybody's got their own ship to sail. Yeah. But if you make it interesting and you ask and you seek the right people and, and, and get them interested in, I, I tell people, show me and I'll see, tell me and I'll hear, get me involved and I'll understand. So you don't show them and you don't tell them, you bring them to your, to your, your events, your whatever, get them involved. And then they'll understand, and you've got a better chance of of drawing them into to helping the cause. Wow, wow. Well, I mean, that certainly is sage advice, and I know it's difficult to get folks motivated. And, and you know, my my wife always tells me because I'll tell her so I hate to say it, I hate to admit it, but sometimes I say I'm busy. She or she says to me, she goes, everyone's busy, <laughs> and I end up doing whatever she wants me to to do. Um, Good move uh, there. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, but that should be one of your laws of success: keep your wife happy. <laughs> <laughs> that makes your world better. Well, 30, uh, half hour, um, hour goes by quick bird. I could talk to you forever. Um, we've covered a lot of great things and I appreciate your time. Most importantly, I appreciate what you do for people, emerging leaders and giving your time to ESA South and all the other organizations that you speak to. Um, so I thought we'd end this morning's coffee with something kind of fun. Um, you know, I've been to waffle houses all over the place, uh, primarily late at night <laughs> after other activities. And uh, I, so you work in there 40 years. What does Bert Thornton order at Waffle House when you go into Waffle House as a customer? What's the best thing on the menu? Well, for me, it's a Texas cheese steak plate scattered, smothered, and peppered. S scattered, smothered, and peppered, but not covered and chunked. Why not covered and chunked? Well, covered is cheese. And I put the cheese on the Texas cheese steak melt. And I don't want to put it on the hash browns and the chunked is ham. And if I ever order grits, I tell them to chunk and pepper the ham, uh, chunk and pepper the grits, which is grilled ham and grilled jalapenos in the grits. But yeah, wow. you, and we have people who order everything. They get the hash brown, scatter, smother, cover, chunk, dice top, pepper, cap, and country. And that's me. Does the, hey, does the grill operator you, get, <laughs> Is that what you get, Wes? That's me. That's what I order. <laughs> hey, does the grill operator get overwhelmed when you hit them with all that stuff on the on the hash brown? No, um, because they don't have back in my day. They had to remember the orders. Now they they cheat. They have something called a magic marker system. If you watch in a Waffle House, when the salesperson calls in the order, the first thing that happens is that the grill operator will pull a plate down and start placing jelly packs, condiments on the plate, and they literally paint the order on the plate. Really? So, yes, sir. So if if you're if you're cooking um, and you want to take a break, you could literally walk off the floor and I could come in and I could see what's on the grill and see what's on the plates and pick up. You wouldn't have to say a word. I could just pick up and start cooking. Wow. Too. That's awesome. Yeah. Watch that the next time you go. One, one more thing, Jeff. Yes, sir. For the folks out there, my email address is A S T. That's like Alpha Sierra Tango, but it's my initials. A S T three, the number three at Cox.net. A S T three at Cox.net. If I can help you out in any way, um, please email me and we'll see uh, what I can do for you. Thank happy, you so much. happy to help anybody anytime uh, to be better, more successful. No, thank you so much for your time this morning and, uh, Really appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to order your order next time I go to Waffle House. I'm going to do it. I'm going to say, this is what Bert gets. But wait. Well, take, take me with you. We'll order okay, it. Okay, we'll, we'll do it. And hey, hey, you know what would be perfect? And I'll ask Doyle to join us. Wouldn't that be fun? 
I'm going to do that. That'd be great. That'd be Let's great. do that. Um, but one final question. This is, uh, people are going to be watching this and they know that Burt's Chili, it's your recipe. So you would order that other, the Texas cheese steak plate over the Burt's Chili? No matter what Waffle House I go to, the first thing I start with is I tell them, give me a little taste, or just a little, not a full bowl, but a taste of the chili. Because if your name is on it, you will taste it everywhere you go. And uh, it's actually, my wife orders it every time. Um, but let me tell you something. Over the years, I've I've had enough Burt's chili. I've, I've moved on. I go back now to make sure it's right. Oh, good for you. Right on. Outstanding. Well, all, all of you guys, thank you so much for getting up early. What a, what a fun, entertaining uh, morning. And I appreciate you, Bert, and I appreciate you, Eric, and you, Wes. Thank you guys for what you all do. And um, we'll see you next month at the 92nd Coffee with the Commissioner. Everyone have a great rest of the week.